All right, today is a lecture day. We're gonna do a lecture and maybe look at this iPad Pro. I wanted to clear up something that I get a lot of um, trolling about, which is my, my saying, I'm not wearing my It's Never the Coil t-shirt today. I usually am. Um, I've been known for saying it's never the coil. And so I wanted to kind of address what do I mean when I say it's never the coil and why do I say that? And that this is about sort of the, the history, it's a history lesson on iPhone board repair. So we're gonna start back at the iPhone 3GS, which had a signature problem, the coil. The coil failed all the time in, uh, in iPhone 3GS that had no backlight. So not just any coil, but a very specific coil. So uh, let's take a look first at the iPhone 3GS schematic and try to understand the backlight circuit and the architecture of the backlight circuit. So I'm gonna try to do something a little different and let's see if we can do Chrome. Okay, so let's go over to uh, this first tab. So this is um, this, that's not what I want to do. I think I want to go to the actual schematic first. Let's do schematic. There we go. So this is the iPhone uh, 3GS uh, schematic, which was kind of hard, hard to find. And I wanted to kind of look a little bit at the backlight circuit. So there's a lot going on. This schematic kind of has everything all on one page, which, which makes it a little bit harder to, to follow, I think. Um, but over here, let's see, I don't think you can see my cursor unless I go over here to, uh, unless I go over to here, then I think you can see my cursor. Um, so let me move this. Uh, let's see, we've got a power management chip over here and we can see a lot of these lines, LED out and boost switch and boost switch current sensing PNN and this one uh, boost prot. So let's, these all have to do with backlight. So the PMIC is a chip here that's regulating backlight. So let's follow some of these lines and we can follow over here to, well, this thing is probably going to move a little bit slow. So let's slide over to here. All right. So here is the backlight coil L6, the backlight coil, and you can read its stats there. And the backlight coil is uh, connected here to a guy called Q3, and this is in the iPhone 3GS. So Q3 um, has the backlight coil kind of inputting here, and this backlight coil is on VCC main. So here we can see VCC main is labeled. So we would expect to have our regular VCC main voltage, voltage going through the coil. What is a coil? A coil is pretty much a slinky and we'll look at what a coil actually is in a, in a second. So this guy then is going to control what happens at the coil. The, what the coil does is a coil will um, generate a magnetic field in response to electrical current that's going around and around the slinky wire inside the coil. And you can, I'm going to show you a, a really well written blog entry that really explains the concept of a coil and a chip that switches the voltage on and off at the coil and how that combines together to create this circuit element called a DC DC boost circuit, which is used to generate that big backlight voltage because the backlight voltage is a lot higher than the incoming battery voltage. And the way you get from a standard 3.8 battery voltage up to a backlight voltage which can be 15 20 you know even 30 volts depending on the device um, that's a dc dc boost circuit so here we have q3 and q3 has an internal diode that will allow this voltage to pass through and if we follow that line we can see that line will come over it's kind of hard to navigate on this guy it comes over and it plugs into guess where it plugs into the lcd connector so this is the lcd connector itself and then we can see that there's some control of that circuit as well so there is some uh, when the voltage builds up too high then it's shunted back to ground and when uh, the voltage here on q3 it gets sort of over current then the um, 
then Q3 itself is sort of opened and closed in order to generate that switch, switching of voltage on and off at the, at the coil that's required to create the DC-DC boost circuit architecture. But really, this point, the point here that I want you to get is that the, the number of elements in this DC-DC boost circuit are small. Q3, this guy, and the coil itself VCC main, of course, is going to be there if, you, if your device is on, it just doesn't have a backlight. So the entire problem of why don't I have backlight is pretty small. It's the coil, or it's the chip, or it's going to be one of these little dudes that are in the path of the chip to, to the connector. So for the actual backlight power line, if you follow it, ee, it kind of goes around here, and there's, there's not a whole lot going on. So let's now go and look at, I wanted to just kind of show you this link as I was figuring out what I, what I wanted to talk about here. Um, I wanted to show you this link that I thought was a really great one, and I'm surprised to see this. This is back in history. This is back in time before people fixed iPhones all the time, before there were a lot of YouTube videos out there. And I thought this was um, kind of unexpected, at least for me. So here's these guys at A32 Wireless. And A32 Wireless have written this really detailed and awesome explanation of how this circuit would work. So let's kind of read through that for a second. So this says the iPhone 3GS no backlight repair. And it says pretty much the same thing that we just said, but with a lot more detail. And, you, and I think sometimes detail can kind of be overwhelming. And uh, so let's kind of get the gist of what they're saying here. So this says, you know, the 3GS LCD backlight is a couple of tiny LEDs. In order to light up the LEDs at the same time, you need to have a higher voltage on, rather than battery voltage. VCC main goes through a bunch of dudes and then, he's, uh, and then it ultimately ends up at the LCD uh, connector and therefore at the LCD itself. And so it says that U18, so the power management chip pin has a dude named SW Boost, so the switching line that provides a chain of on off rectangular pulses to Q3. All right, so that's kind of makes sense. Here's uh, Q3, and this is all flipped upside down. Here is the coil itself. Here's VCC main, and so we can see that the Q3 has the ability to send this voltage through or it can open up this MOSFET and send it to ground. And that's gonna be controlled by this SW boost from the PMIC. So the PMIC is gonna click, click, switch, switch, on, off, on, off, on, off, and generate sort of these square shaped or rectangular shaped on, off, on, off, on, off. Now what does that do to the coil? And it tells us that um, the transistor Q3, so MOSFET and transistor kind of mean the same thing, transistor Q3 will be turned on and off accordingly by the power management chip. So when Q3 is on, the energy is charged on L6. And L6 is the, the backlight coil. L6 will then rise in voltage. When Q3 is off, then energy is going to go through the internal diode that's inside of Q3 and it's going to come out here on this LCD backlight CA line and go out to the LCD connector. So the power management chip switch, switch, switches Q3, which will alternately build the voltage at, at the coil and then let it through to um, really charge up this ca these capacitors that are here, which smooths out the, the, uh, the voltage so that the actual backlight doesn't flicker going like this, um, that the capacitor becomes charged and then kind of bleeds that voltage out and down to the LCD connector, lighting up all of the LEDs. All right, so let's see, when Q3 is off, energy goes through the diode uh, and it comes out, the energy piles up on the, on the capacitor, the capacitor has finally a big enough voltage to light up all the LEDs on the LCD power at the same time. And then the theory on switching boost circuit is shown below. So I like this link. So this link is, I don't know if you can see it uh, with, uh, with my head in the way, or, or let's turn off the iPad Rehab logo for a second. So you can see this, this uh, link and you can go copy or type that in if you wanna check that out some more. All right, so let's go back. So, um, the theory is below and I think it's great to read that. So no display, no light, no display, dim backlight is caused by something bad somewhere in this tiny little circuit. 
All right, and so then it's uh, gonna, gonna talk about regulation of this stuff. So at the same time, out from the connector, you've got LCD BLCC, that's different than CA, which comes back through a, what we call a filter, FL27, and it uh, ends up going back to the power management chip. Let's scroll down here, and then we're, it's gonna talk about this regulation here. So let's read down. There's two protection circuits, R105, so where's R105? R105 is uh, this guy here, and you can kind of see, ah, I see what that is. I see ground, I see a resistor, and I can see these two lines coming out from either side of the resistor, so that is going to be a, um, a, a current sensing circuit. So there's two signals, boost sense P and boost sense N, that are connected to either side of R105, and they are going to go from here to the power management chip. Here they are, boost sense P and N, going into the power management chip, which is really controlling all of this. So R105 senses, current sensing, senses the current flow on the gate of Q3, and Q3 is the guy that switches, that turns on and off the, the you know, either lets the voltage pile up on the coil or pass through out to the screen. So there's uh, two, two of those uh, current sensing signals that go to U18. If an overcurrent occurs, then U18 is gonna control the, um, the incoming signal to Q3, that SW boost signal, and either turn it off or on. So basically say switch faster or switch slower so that you can kind of control the output. The, you, can, you can modulate the brightness of the screen, which we know because you can make your screen really bright or really dim. Okay, so that's how some of that control works. And then number two, there's a voltage divider R104 and R21. So who are those guys? So here is R104 up here and R21, and you can see these two guys are on either side of this guy, boost. I don't know if that's pro T or pro, or I, when I look at it, I think protein, <laughs> but that's probably biology background talking. So a voltage divider outputs a signal called boost protein, which also goes back to the power management chip and provides some feedback uh, to the, the PMIC, which will then allow the PMIC to control what's going on here at the backlight circuit. So as the boost voltage, the backlight line, as it goes up, 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 if it goes over the limit, then this is going to kick in. Um, see how this has got kind of a foot here on the backlight output line that's going out to the connector? And this is going to then, when this builds up and it gets too high, boost uh, protein is going to go uh, tell, here he is, boost protein is going to tell, hey PMIC, get too hot in here, time to turn on the fan to cool, cool this down. And so then that would be another way that, uh, that uh, protection can happen. So um, as the, the backlight line goes over the limit, boost prot goes high and then the PMIC will make the adjustment on the switch line. So PMIC is doing everything. So let's kind of recap that. PMIC is sending out the boost switcher, click, 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 switching, switching at Q3. So here's boost switch, switching on and off this little transistor. When, <clears throat> when it switches it, uh, it can connect source and drain here to allow the uh, buildup of this voltage to go to ground and then it can stop doing that and then the voltage will build up here on the coil so the coil the switching chip and the control are all essential in order to have backlight and then uh, it, after this it talks about how switching boost circuits work and this gets a little bit um you know a little there's a little calculus here and you, you can read over this. I think it's a great summary of how these, these sort of common circuit elements work. Um, when I teach this at Practical Board Repair School, I kind of uh, use analogies and, and make it a lot lighter. But in general, in order to have a DC-DC boost circuit, you have to have these sort of common elements. You've got to have a coil. You've got to have a chip that can switch the coil. And then you, you have to recognize that what the coil does is that the coil has this magical ability to take 
a current that's going through uh, in a spiral and turn it into a magnetic field and that that ultimately is going to lead to a higher boosted voltage uh, leaving and then that's going to go out to the LCD connector. You've got to have these caps otherwise your backlight will flicker and um, that's pretty much how, how that all works. So where's the failure point? So in the iPhone 3GS that we just looked at, the failure point was a signature failure, the coil. The coil is, it was 90% was of all backlight problems in the iPhone 3GS. And why is that? And the answer is because of its board location and the structure of the coil. So uh, let's, let's click this off. How do I do that? Let's click that off. And let's uh, click Hmm, how do I get back out of that? I didn't click off. Click off. And click off. And click off. All right, so there's all these different types of coils that are out there. And you can see they're all just slinkies that are surrounded with some kind of a housing. And they come in these different styles. And so you could imagine that depending on the style of the coil that's on the board and its location on the board, it's either going to be something that, that can get damaged or not. So some of the more modern coils are completely surrounded in this magnetic housing and the actual wire of the coil is totally encapsulated and you can't get to it at all. Um, one of the, Some of the older style coils look, look a little bit more like, um, <coughs> like one of these guys probably that one there. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. And you can see the wire there. So that means that a well-targeted molecule of cat piss could chew right through that in water damage. And that is what happened because the location on the 3GS of the coil was right at the very edge of the board. And that's where water went. And water would erode the connection of the coil wire to the board itself. And so it, it's not going to work if it doesn't have a connection, if it doesn't have continuity, then that's the same thing as just kind of washing out a drawbridge. That particular coil failed all the time. And uh, let's, let's, uh, let me see if I, why is that odd? What did I do? How did I mess that up? Um, my chat is kind of messed up. We'll, we'll move that over. All right, so let's see where we want to go next. Let's go to uh, the next tab. Um, oh yeah, so this is this I thought was great. How do these coils work, or what influences the ability of a coil to do its job? So you can you can use in design a different coil uh, for a different application where the thing you really care about is the coil's ability to induce that magnetic field, which is what turns into the boost voltage. So different coils have different structures that will have a, overall at the end of the day they'll have a different inductance and inductance means the magical ability of the coil to boost voltage so what are the factors that go in i mean these are just slinkies you know what what makes one slinky have more inductance than another and so we can read here that um okay one of them is how many turns of the wire do you have if you have a lot of turns of the wire you know more more slinky turns then you have more inductance than if you just have a few turns of the wire. Uh, next is how narrow or skinny or fat is the actual kind of surface area of the, of the slinky. So if you've got a fat, dense slinky, it's going to have more inductance than if you have the same number of turns in a narrow little uh, uh, spaghetti noodle slinky. How about coil length? All right, if you compact that coil down, you'll have more inductance. And if you have the same number of turns in the same area, but it's spread out like a like a unwound uh, cheap slinky that's been down the stairs too many times, then you'll have less inductance. And then here's another one that's a pretty big one, which is what's in the center of it. So the the whole magical property of a coil to generate this magnetic field and then therefore a boost voltage leaving the coil has to do with what's in the center of it and how mag what's the magnetic permeability of the stuff that's in the center so if you have something that has nothing in the center so it's just air it's going to have less inductance than if you have something that has 
uh, a, something that's kind of magnetic, like in this example, it says, well, what if you stick soft iron in there? Iron sounds magnetic. Then that's, wow, that's a big difference. The same coil with the same surface area, the same relative compactness, the same number of turns can have really different inductance values, the magical power to boost, depending on what's inside that thing. And I think that is going to be really important when we think about modern coil failures in the, the sort of later generation devices where we're starting to see these coil failures again. And then you can do some calculus and figure out exactly how these things sort of interplay and which ones are more important than others. All right, so then let's go over here. All right, so what does that mean? That means for the iPhone 3GS, this was back in like 2010, 2011, the, the, you know, the world kind of figured out, well, this is a very common problem that's taking out all of these iPhones, and the failure point seemed to be this particular coil. And this one has, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a big, big uh, microscope view. Hopefully you can see that right there. Let's see if you can see that or not. Okay, there you go. Um, of this particular 6R8 coil. And you can see, while that coil is very exposed, and you know it's tiny and when you drop that phone in water or you know even get like a hard drop that coil just gets corroded because it's totally out in the open it's right on the edge of the board it's right where the water goes and the the biology of how the phone allows water to go in where does the water go in it went in right at the coil and fry, and and severed the connection of the coil to the trace and that was a really common fault. So what does the world think then? Oh, okay, backlight, you know, the, the world, you know, I think all of us just sort of love to, to categorize things. I mean, when we're presented with a whole lot of information, like that first thing we just went over, it's pretty easy to say, all right, what's important here? Okay, you gotta have a switching chip, you gotta have control, you gotta have a coil, you gotta have a diode, you gotta have a path to connector, that's it. And, uh, oh, and you gotta have some caps on there. And so I think that the, the world just loves to make complex stuff simple, which is great for how human brains process information. We have to learn how to fish out what's important, what's the buzzword, and ignore everything else. And that's what happened with the iPhone 3GS, is what happens was you don't have a backlight, it's the coil, bro. And that was absolutely true for the iPhone 3GS. So that then leads to um, well, let's see. That, well, that led to a lot of sales of coils and a lot of people doing, you know, a little YouTube video where they didn't necessarily read or understand or know anything about the circuit. They never thought about the, you know, the, the, the caps that never failed and they never thought about, you know, any, anything else, the feedback. They never thought about boost pro or boost switch or any of that. They never thought about the PMIC's control because none of that ever broke. They just knew that the coil failed. So what should you do? Replace coil, bro, 100% tested working. And that led to a, a huge, uh, you know, kind of the beginning of I, iPhone board repair forum presence. Um, and here's where the problem started. The problem started when due to that kind of buzzword association, backlight failure, it's the coil, bro, that led to a carryover of that signature problem and an assumption, a wrong assumption, that the coil was always going to be the failure point in any backlight circuit. And that was a great big problem. So here we can see, I mean, it's fascinating if you kind of go dig this stuff up. <coughs> here we can see a video. Remember when, um, when uh, CyberDoc was the was the be all and end all in in board repair so so uh you know kai from uh cyberdoc started a business where he was really a part seller and he teamed up with philippe puska and together they they made a forum and they both made videos under the cyberdoc brand and and a lot of this is kind of what we knew at the time as as we went on and so here's a video where he's saying uh, he's starting to sell the iphone 4 backlight coil and the iPhone 4 backlight IC. Hmm. Now IC means integrated circuit chip in general. And in the iPhone 3GS, Q3 absolutely is in you know, it's a it's a 
uh, a chip. It has some logic. It has inputs and outputs. Um, but in the iPhone 4, all of that was done by the PMIC. There was no Q3 anymore. So there was just a, an independent diode. That's not really an IC. It's just a diode. Uh, but they, they continued to call it backlight IC, even though it was just a diode, and then backlight coil. So, but this is a different phone now. So now we don't have that same 6R8 coil located on the spot of the board that gets watered. Now we're in a completely different animal. The iPhone 4, the iPhone 4S, the iPhone 5, you know, all of those guys have a completely different biology. So here's this guy who is, who, you know, so CyberDoc has made a video that is talking about iPhone 4 backlight IC, meaning the diode, and iPhone 4 backlight coil. And let's see if we can look at the iPhone 4 schematic. Let's see if I can find that. So let's, let me dig that up. I got the iPhone 4S. So we'll, we'll skip ahead to the iPhone 4S, which is different than the 4. Let's click over to um, schematics and turn off Chrome. All right, so here we are at the iPhone 4S. This is the 4S schematic. And here we are at the LCD connector. And now we can see, ah, we can see some things that sound familiar. Oh, okay, there we go. LCD BLCA, hey, that's gonna be the backlight main power line, and it is. And then we can see LCD backlight CC and then we've got this guy, which is image power, image power. So those are unrelated to backlight. So again, backlight is just these two lines at the iPhone 4S. So where do they go? So we can kind of follow these lines. And now we're in more of the traditional schematic that we all recognize. And they get to these two components here, filters. So filters, if we look at the filter, we can see that these filters, they themselves are inductors and you could call them coils. They're in that same class but they kind of have a different pur purpose. They're not there to induce a uh, boost voltage. They don't have an inductance because they are a coil that's really thin and tiny and probably doesn't have a central core. So these filters are very prissy and they do not like to have the current exceed a maximum on that line. And that's actually written down. They will tolerate up, up to 0.2 amps so 200 milliamps and anyone that's ever taken a dc power supply and and you know done this where you you know, take a dc power supply and you take the the positive and negative alligator clamps and you put them together as in shorting vcc main to ground that generates you know uh, one two three amps that's way more than the 200 milliamps that these backlight filters can take and remember the the whole backlight line is kind of um, a boost of vcc main so vcc main is always present it always has a minimum voltage of vcc main and then when backlight is engaged that's boosted up to a level that will actually light up the screen but vcc main is always on that line so now you can kind of think about all right, well then what's gonna be the, the failure point? If water doesn't hit a very open and exposed coil, how do these things fail? Because you do have backlight failures on every device. And the answer is gonna be it fails in pretty much every phone since the iPhone 3GS. It fails because people fail to recognize that um, here at the, at the connector, that that even if you, if you have the battery connected even if the phone itself is off you still have your live vcc main voltage coming in here even if the backlight driver's not switching and even if you have no activity at the coil at all the coil is a slinky it's a wire it's going to pass vcc main right on through so if that battery's connected you're going to have vcc main present here at the connector so what does it take to actually cause something like this. What does it take to actually cause a current spike on VCC main? All you have to do is touch that backlight line, which is VCC main, to ground. And how would you do that? Well, it's pretty easy to do when you're trying to plug in a screen and you don't get that 
clicky, perfect fit on the first try, it's really easy to just rub together VCC main and ground. So what happens in that moment? Then you're gonna create this spike of current <coughs> on your backlight anode line, and that is going to blow these filters. So now we have a different signature failure. In the iPhone uh, 4S and pretty much every other iPhone, the thing that happens to them is failure to understand how important it is to disconnect the battery before doing a screen swap because you think, oh, it's off, it's fine. It's not fine, you have live VCC main in your connector. And then when you click in that connector, if you touch ground to that line, you will cause a free path to ground, woo, current spike. And that will take out your filters. If the filters, you know, if they experience that insult, some of them are, are more resistant than others. Some of them are incredibly prissy. And I think some connectors are more um, amenable to that accidental connection of VCC main and ground uh, than others. You know, if, uh, if another one it's, well, there's, you know, it's kind of more work to touch, touch that to ground and others it's like an instant um, anytime, you, anytime you ever plug in a screen. That's sort of what kind of creates the spectrum of how common backlight faults are. But they all have that same underlying biology. The problem is going to be the filter. So where does, that, where does that leave us? So if we kind of accept then that for the iPhone you know, 4S and all of its brethren and iPads, iPad Air, iPad Mini, all of these guys, they all experience the same fault, which is um, filter damage. That's going to be the number one cause. They can have other causes. You can get a short to ground. You can get water damage elsewhere in the circuit. But the number one fault is going to be filter damage. So what does that mean? So let's kind of take that knowledge and then just sort of apply and look to see what was the climate, the history like now when the iPhone 4S comes out. So what do you think happens on the forum when you are sitting there with an iPhone 4S and it has no backlight? What's the actual problem? Probably a filter problem. And when you type, please bro, my iPhone 4S has no backlight, and that's how people interacted. Few people cared to understand or recognize that it was even possible for somebody like a stay-at-home mom in her kitchen to just kind of look around and figure this stuff out. It's, it's um, you know, less, it doesn't really require an engineering degree to read that first blog. You can kind of skim through it and figure out what he's talking about with a little bit of effort. And so, but people, people didn't realize that. They thought the only way to fix this stuff is to just kind of please bro solutions. And I think that there was some sort of, you know, kind of, ego thing going on, maybe, I don't know, where the guys that were able to look and read a schematic liked making solutions, and so the sort of please bro community grew where people expected to please bro, you know, solutions that would just tell me what to do, I don't want to have to understand this, and the people that did understand it were happy to fill that need because they, they liked the, you know, being able to have the joy of, of sharing knowledge and helping other people actually fix stuff. But the problem with it is that nobody other than the people reading the schematics, nobody overall was really thinking that much about it. So what do you think the please bros said? Please bros would then start to parrot each other. So you'd have the few guys that were actually reading the schematic and generating new solutions. And then you had everybody else was please bro sharing that, that information and misapplying it. So iPhone 4S, I got no backlight, bro. Please bro, help me. And, and any forum you, you would look at, someone would say, it's the coil, bro, 100% tested working. Change the coil, bro. Yeah, change the coil, bro, works for me. And so now let's think about what happens if you actually go to change the coil on an iPhone 4S. So here's an iPhone 4S, so let's look at it. So where is the problem? The problem is gonna happen out here at the connector itself. So here's your LCD connector. And those filters, those tiny little dudes that are probably actually the problem, they are, um, they're right here by the connector. So these are your, your backlight filters. Those guys are pretty easy to change. You know, take one off, stick one on, you're done. Um, but if you are, if you're sort of please bro believing that it's the coil bro, all right, where's the coil? Let's find it. All right, so to get to the coil, we gotta go here, we gotta 
we're going to jack up this shield. And what do you notice about this? See a whole lot of underfill. This is the power management chip, which is doing the switching, and there's just a sea of thick, black, heavy-duty underfill. And can we put heat on this? No way, because underfill is is uh, going to not expand and contract the same way the solder does, and it's going to create big problems. All right, so then where's the backlight coil? Here it is. Either that one or that one. I actually don't remember. I'm going to go with it's probably this one. Probably that one. This is the backlight coil, and then this is a tiny little diode, which was referred to as the backlight IC. I honestly think just to make it sound more complex than it, than it actually is. Uh, so this is the backlight coil. Now, if you think about what does it take to actually change that now? How are you going to get that off? It's surrounded by underfill, and it's surrounded by this bracket. Are you going to be able to get that off with an iron? You know, not, not that well. I mean, you can. Wouldn't it be easier to get it off with hot air? Yes. So if you try to get this off with hot air, what's going to happen? If you put hot air in this area, you are almost certainly going to just create a big spooge of solder balls under that PMIC. So now, and that's, that's what the problem is. So now you went from having a highly repairable problem, change the backlight filter. And instead of recognizing that problem, you followed please bro advice and you're putting heat right here. You took a repairable phone and made it an unrepairable phone. And that ruined, I have no idea how many hundreds or thousands of phones were were lost you know how much money in in phones these were the current phone at the time hundreds and hundreds of dollars per phone and you're <coughs> you're taking relatively minor problems and turning it into dead phones and that's kind of when when i came along and you know sitting in the dining room and kind of just seeing people parroting this it's the coil bro it's not the fucking coil it's it's not going to be the coil what would it take to actually make this particular coil fail? I don't think I've ever seen an iPhone 4S coil fail, ever. It just doesn't happen. You know, it's hard for water to, to actually get in there, and all of this is pretty much waterproof because it's all covered with underfill. There's no real way for water to ever bother that coil. It can't do it. It's not going to happen. What does it take to make a coil stop being a coil? It's a slinky. You'd have to sever its connection to the pads you'd have to break the wire in it or you'd have to do something that fucked with its inductance or changed the material in the center of it that's not there there's no mechanism for that to happen in the iphone 4s so in the iphone 4s backlight problems are never going to be that coil. The backlight coil is just not going to fail. Practically, it just doesn't fail. And I was very passionate about this particular issue at the time just because it kind of spoke to this, you know, hey, let's stop please bro solutioning everything. Let's stop sharing stuff without, you know, really thinking about it and understanding. Because you know, it, it, not to be like arrogant about that, but because I was a mother with zero circuit training. I've never taken an electronics course. I read some stuff on the internet and, and you know, can, can read a blog like the, the first one that we just went through. Fantastic stuff. It's really not that hard to learn, to, to kind of become educated on this stuff. So I really objected to... Um, this sort of method of thinking, which is just please bro all the solutions, please bro the world. So let's go back to, uh, let's, let's go back out of here and let's go back out of here and let's go back to here and talk about what happened. So you have videos like this where it's saying iPhone 4 backlight IC, iPhone 4 backlight coil. You know, that's really not, not change this coil and integrated circuit chip, fucking diode. This coil received current amplified to supply the, I, the, the diode, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the problem is the filters. You know, it's, it's going to be the filters. And then you see stuff like this. Here's somebody, 
You can buy, you wanna, you wanna buy, what, sold 91. iPhone 4G backlight coil LCD IC, 6R8. Well, this isn't even the 6R8. It's just using these same buzzwords from the 3GS. The 6R8 coil is the style in the 3GS. It's not the style here in the iPhone 4. And so no one should ever buy this. This is not, this is not something you're ever, ever gonna need. Um, I think I, I saw one that had a short and I ended up replacing the coil on it. Um, one, and I just took it from a donor board. So this is something that no one, that these 91 people do got scammed. Uh, so this kind of stuff is what made me um, end up coming along and, and getting, getting kind of pissed off. And then here comes something like this. this. This is then the sort of the natural extension of this. So now we're in 2012. So this guy says, iPhone backlight repair, the ugly truth. Why iPhone backlight coil repair is a farce. And so this guy says, uh, I covered the ugly truth about phones with backlight coils or backlight IC chips. Here's what generally happens. You drop your phone in water, turn it on, there's no backlight. The screen is black, blah, 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 blah. Um, swap the screen, still no backlight. You have a backlight coil or backlight IC chip that's burned out. That's um, the actual damage done to the phone isn't the culprit. You damage the motherboard and the ensuing short surges the coil chip and burns it out. Blah, 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 blah. So he's saying that this stuff is super tiny and here's, I uncovered the real story surrounding iPhone backlight repair. Uh, so he, did some research and he went to eBay. I found several sellers on eBay offering replacement coil and IC chips for 15 to 30 bucks. They said that it was reasonably doable if you had the right equipment. Uh, so he looked into buying it and then he, uh, he noticed the replacement coil IC sellers on eBay had no suggestions for repair videos. Um, so he started getting suspicious and then he finally made contact with an iPhone repair service shop in Springfield, Missouri that mentioned repairing iPhone 3GS coils on their website. And after that discussion that ensued, all my suspicions were confirmed. The gentleman that I spoke to said they charge $100 to replace coils on phones with no warranty or guarantee. What the heck kind of repair is that? Um, and he said the reason is because most iPhone replacement coils burn out within a few days of insul installation. It's because the backlight coil for something that's not the 3GS isn't, isn't the problem. And even if it is the 3GS, you have to make sure that you have um, dealt with anything else that's also wrong in the backlight circuit, especially if there was water damage. So, uh, this is, so he's saying, Scam artists, you know, everybody's, he, said, he thinks that doing motherboard repair is impossible in general. Um, the sad news, the integrated circuit board isn't cheap. It's the most expensive thing. So he's saying <coughs> you'd have to buy a new motherboard. And then he's talking about people selling the cheap boards that are bare boards with no chips on the board. So what in the world can a person do with a bare board? I have no idea. Tough to swallow realization. Here comes the hard truth. The fact you must understand and accept iPhones of any model, if you're thinking about it, here's what you need to understand. That, um, that a burned out backlight coil chip is a disaster. Um, if your iPhone screen is completely dim and you need a new backlight coil, well, forget fixing it. It's fucked up beyond all repair. What? Either replace the logic board or throw the thing out. Conclusion, you know. He's a iFubar specialist. So that guy is now, you know, he, he's noticing, yeah, you're right, this is, this is bullshit. This is not a fix. This is no warranty, no guarantee, because you're not addressing the problems. You're just, and it's easy, you know, it's easy to change a filter on an iPhone 4. There's no reason to throw these boards away. There's no reason to put hot air on these coils and ruin them. And this is the climate that we were in when along comes Jessa and I wrote this blog article. So this is now in 2014 
where I wrote this now sort of classic blog thing, which has all been transferred from one website to another, so it's all in bad font and bad colors now. But, um, you know, yeah, not even the rice myth is as rampant as the little eye that's posted on repair forums around the world every single day. I can't see anything on the screen, but I know the phone is on. Help! It's probably the coil. Yeah, bro, replace the coil. A bunch of likes upvoting and general head nodding occur from people that have never actually seen a backlight coil. Every day, around the world, every repair forum. You know you've done it yourself. Everyone has, but now it's time to step into the backlight. So then it just kind of goes on and talks about what at the time I knew about backlights, which is certainly less than I know now. Um, and, you know, but it's kind of the same thing. You got a chip, you got a coil, you got a diode, you got a filter, and you got a connector. And, um, yeah, why do you insist on calling me the backlight IC? Huh? So this kind of talks about DC Deucey Bursar. And here's an example of a burned out filter. And that's what filter failures look like. And they're super, super common. And, um, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here we go. So if you're trying to fix a phone with black, on the LCD connector and you wonder why the screen won't light up. What's mostly likely the problem? The coil or anything but the coil. Give yourself a star if you chose B. All right, so that that is my kind of rant on um, on why I started saying it's never the coil. And it was and, and when I say it's never the coil, what I mean is if you are talking about a backlight failure where you have no backlight at all and you're not talking about an iPhone 3GS and you are in the time frame between the iPhone 4 and all the way up to uh, the, the 5 series, it's not going, there, there's no signature failures of coil failures in any of those phones or any of those iPads that were all within those times. So that's a whole bunch of devices. And then when we got to the iPhone 6, we started to see a different signature failure. Um, the problem in the iPhone 6 is not a you know, short to ground outside at the connector. The problem in the iPhone 6 is that one of the caps, remember the circuit uh, back on the 3GS, that cap 201, uh, every iPhone has backlight caps and in the iPhone 6, the caps just decide to be a wire. One of them does randomly, usually after a drop. So that's a different that's a different way to make a backlight fail. Everybody else that had filter failures, the filter is acting like a fuse and it's protecting the rest of the circuit from a short to ground out of the connector. In the iPhone 6, the failure is internal. So it's the, the first time since the iPhone 3GS that we see kind of an internal to the circuit failure. So in the iPhone 6, there's a signature failure, and we've covered it on this channel uh, more than once. And you, you know, talked about how to fail, how to, how to, how to fix that. But the problem, it's, it's still not that the coil fails; it's that the coil loses some of its inductance, probably because either the wire, the slinky inside, um, it gets so hot that the insulation will burn off creating a lowered induction because you have less turns as they bridge together. Or it's that the center core gets hot and, and changes and boils. I mean, we see this green shit coming out of the top of the coil and that then changes the magnetic permeability of that substance and therefore lowers the inductance of the coil. And in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that probably that is the green stuff, but I, I really don't have any way to know. So either way, the heat from that short will, will change the biology of the coil. It doesn't stop being a coil. It doesn't stop working. It doesn't stop making backlight. You still get a backlight. It just doesn't have the inductance to come to full brightness, and therefore it is part of the problem in iPhone 6. So in iPhone 6, you can find the short, you can fix the diode, which is always going to fail. And then at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to replace the coil because it'll have a lowered inductance. Um, in the iPhone 6S, same thing happens. If you, if you happen to have the fault, which is short to ground, far less common than having the filter failure in the 6S. That's very common. Uh, but the iPhone 6S can also get um, backlight faults as well. 
So I, I don't want for anyone to, to kind of, you know, hear the phrase, and I saw somebody recently say, well, I, didn't, I just didn't suspect the coil in an iPhone 6 that clearly had coil damage. Um, because I always thought it's never the coil. Well, don't please bro my anti please bro solution. You know, when I say it's never the coil, I'm talking about a very specific his history of iPhone repair um, meme, which is this combating please bro solutions, applying logic from the iPhone 3GS signature failures to every other iPhone and, and doing that without thinking. But that it, I don't want anyone to think that it's never the coil, um, that, that, that that somehow means that coils can't fail and that you know, any coil is immune to failure, your charging coil, you know, that's, that's not it at all. Each phone gets its own signature failures and you just have to think about the history and, um, and, and to, to test. It is pretty hard to make a coil fail. In order to make it fail, it has to come off of the board, so lose its connection to the board, or it has to be altered in a way that's going to change its inductance. And even then, it'll still kind of work. It just won't work as well as designed, and therefore needs to be replaced. Um, now, I wanted to show you guys a really fantastic coil um, coil, coil example here. So I want to show you this. This is why I did this video today. It's because of this iPad Pro. So let's look at this iPad Pro. And let's see its current state, which I've kind of forgotten about as I went on a hunt to find all those images. So we're going to plug it in. I'm going to press down on the battery. And it is lighting up. So I've got at least some backlight. So I've got backlight. In fact, you know, this backlight looks pretty good. iPad Pro backlight working. So let's kind of, I don't see anything else going on with that. I think after it boots up, this is, this is in my queue because Christy was, was just, she saw it. She was like, what? How is that even possible? And I think she's trying to troubleshoot touch on it. Um, so I think it has no touch. Yeah, so it has no touch. All right, so now let's take a look. Let's take a look under the microscope and see if you guys are as surprised as Christy was. All right, so I'm going to take the screen off. First, I've isolated the battery. And in the pros, oh my god, that's important. So I'm isolating the battery with just a piece of paper. You have to be really careful on these pros. The pros are tough because they have incredibly prissy touch circuits and backlight circuits and <coughs> they really don't like you to lift their battery up. But you got to do it anyway. All right, so let's go on a hunt. Let's go on a hunt. So in the iPad Pro, just like in um, all of the like the 6 Plus, the 6S Plus, the iPad Air, uh, the iPad 3 and 4, uh, you know, all of these sort of like bigger screen devices, they generally have two independent backlight circuits. So let's take a look and see what we can find. All right, there is a coil. There's two coils there. One, two. Hmm. Did you see that this device had a backlight? Mm-hmm. That means that thing's working. It is really hard to actually damage a coil. That fucking thing works. Who knew? Look at that. Look at the fucking crater. That thing is working, which is pretty unbelievable. In fact, I did a little um, kind of pre-experiment on this to kind of isolate these two backlight lines. So let's just kind of show you that um, I did replace the diode on that, on that line. All right, so we have continuity from this coil to the diode, and then the other side of the diode. Turn back on light. I don't want to have you be bright. All right, and now we'll stick a probe here, and we have continuity over to, guess what this is? A filter across through the filter, and into the connector. So that means this 
filter goes with this diode, which goes with this coil. Now let's follow the path of the other coil. So this other coil goes to this diode, and then it's going to go across, you know, the diode itself does not have continuity. So from the other side of the diode, it goes to this spot here where I removed this filter. So I took this filter off. And then from the filter, it goes into the connector. But we do not have a path without the filter there. We do not have a path to the connector. So this part of the connector right now is dead for backlight. So what does that mean? That means that Jessa took that filter off on the good looking coil so that the backlight you just saw was run entirely by this piece of shit. Yeah. So this, you know, this coils are tough motherfuckers. Look at that thing. That thing fucking works. So I've I have isolated the second line by removing the filter so that the entire backlight is being generated by that slinky. And that's that's kind of why why I did that. So now we can go ahead and put back um, I will put back a filter to fix backlight on this and then I know you know when I was looking at this and Christy's like Christy was just like how the fuck does this have backlight look at this do you see that do you see that how does this have fucking backlight um, and then she didn't understand why it didn't have touch and then you know that's that's pretty easy to figure out if you do this and look look on the side and you actually look at that connector. So she has replaced the touch filter, but she just kind of missed that ain't no way, ain't no how that these pins here, I mean, look at it. They're, they are completely open line, loose, and, and will we'll move if you touch them. So the reason why we don't have touch on this guy is because of that connector. So I'm gonna have to replace the connector to solve touch, but first, let's let's bring back our other let's make our other backlight side great again, and then I will check on chat. And then since it's so late, it took me. I'm not sure I'm gonna ever do one of these again. Like looking up all of that stuff that it's just you know fun and fascinating, but it's kind of takes up too much time but I wanted everyone to know why I have the sort of you know t-shirts and things that say it's never the coil because I, I do recognize that now that the 6 and the 6s are kind of the current phones I don't want the the exact same thing happening again I, I, I started this it's never the coil to differentiate hey, iPhone 3GS is its own thing. Don't apply that to every other phone. It's never the coil. Um, and now I feel like people are applying just as says it's never the coil. So therefore, iPhone 6 and 6S are not going to be the coil. I think the lesson here is to know your signature failures and know that every device is has different kind of weak points. Every device has an Achilles heel of some sort. All right, so let's stick this screen back on and see if we have full backlight. And then I'll have to click over to YouTube. So with the battery still isolated because I don't want to blow my brand new backlight filter that I just stuck in there. I mean, you can see that that happens from a short to ground somewhere. And if there's not a current short to ground in the device, then you know it had to be from plugging the screen in wrong. That's some serious damage. I wonder if somebody tried to jump the backlight filter. I really gotta use my other hand to get this one here. iPad Pros, you guys blows.
I think it's it's such a sad thing that my general assembly skills are so poor that it takes me longer to <coughs> connect a screen than it does to, to change a filter. That is a sad, sorry state of affairs, but oh so true. All right, I think that that's on there. All right, so now we have our backlight is working again, and now to to my eyes, it's brighter than it was. It was, um, I think, noticeably um, a little bit a little bit dim when when I only had it running off of one side. Well, you can see my green screen green. It's like it doesn't like it. It like does something with the shadow on that. All right, so I'm going to make it have touch by changing the connector later because it's super late. Let me see if I can fix my um, my chat app. Otherwise, I think actually that looks hard. Let's just go over and read YouTube chat. Let's see if I can find that. So let's go to iPad Rehab channel and find out that I never hit start stream. That would be pretty funny. That sounds like something I could see myself doing. Oh, live now. Excellent. Chat app, otherwise I think. All right, so there we go. Um, and you guys are talking about junk food, what? All right. Just like me back in the day. Ha ha ha. Uh, the iPad was a big thing. Two people were moving the coil all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've been ripping out the PMIC with a 10 euro hot air gun. Tried to replace by soldering one off a bad base bone. And at the end, they were both dead. All right. Um, almost impossible removing that chip without tearing pads with that underfill. You don't trust the sellers at apppro.ie? All right. Back now from behind my work desk and listening while working. All right, let's see. 4.50 a.m., not sleepy. Oh, I'm totally sleepy, yes. All right, you guys are talking about soldering stations. I, the first phone that I ever fixed uh, was an iPhone 4S that I had to re ultimately replace the PMIC on. It was the infamous toilet phone that I um, that that kind of began my micro soldering career, and I was please bro at the time, and I, um, you know, it wouldn't charge. Everything else was fine, but it would not charge, and it was board level. So. I please broed my way around and, and it was, you know, change this, change this, it's the charging coil. It couldn't have possibly been the charging coil. The coil, coils are tough. If they're sitting there and they look fine and they don't have, I mean, even this one, the center of it looked fucked up. You know, if they don't have green shit coming out of them, you know, if they, they can have cracked housings. They don't care about the top housing. They just care about the core. Um, then it's fine. If a coil looks good, then it is good. You know, if the only way it can really fail is if it comes up off the board somehow. Uh, so, but I didn't know that. So I was like, okay, I guess I will change the coil. And then I put, I did the same thing. I did this to the classic toilet phone. I put hot air from my cheap hot air station that I had when I started out and I struggled off the charging coil. It could have, have possibly been bad. And and you know solder balls are coming out of the PMIC. I have now killed the phone, uh, and it took me it took me two years, two years, to develop the technical proficiency to a realize how stupid I had been and and what a dumb thing it was to have ever attacked that coil to begin with, and and then b to actually have the technical proficiency to dig out all that underfill and successfully change that, that um, 4S PMIC, which I did and then undoubtedly at the time found whatever tiny filter or whatever was actually the problem and fixed that. 
and uh, making that original first ever my own personal in the toilet fix from the toilet phone that my girls had washed for me you know that was probably the the highlight of that was probably my favorite repair ever what seeing that come back on after PMIC replacement and then seeing that it charged that was that was a good one it's losing inductance because the isolation that is pretty much painted on the wire in order to not short it melts that's what I've been saying and you'll see in my channel that things that I believe now I'll think and edit and more information comes and I'll change that's what science is all about so I'm gonna say that instead of it being the insulation of the wire which it might be I bet that it's something to do with decreasing the magnetic permeability whatever that means of the core that that if it you know because we just learned what a huge difference in inductance that is having a piece of iron in there versus air so I think if you fucked with the core and melted it then that may be actually what changes that inductance because it doesn't seem to the coil wire doesn't seem to be all welded together when it comes out we'll, we'll see um, Jessa, what you want of that coil, it's lovely. It has a lovely hole in it. It still works, exactly. Surprise that coreless coil works. Me too. The core is not needed, it's just an amplifier. Well, let's give us some evidence on that because the evidence that we read said that the core is very important. Um, without a core you can charge less energy per cycle well let's say let's use the right terms the core defines the inductance of the coil as do the number of turns of the slinky as does the surface area and uh, as does the diameter so Jessa what caused that coil to be the way it was I don't know it showed up here like that my guess is that when you you have to have a short to ground and since there is no active short to ground in that circuit none of the caps are shorted to ground then the only way that I think it could have been short to ground would be from a either a bad screen or a or a um, like you could have had a tear in the backlight flex that made it bridge to ground it would have been a screen related thing either the connector the screen pushed in so that it's actually has the backlight line touching ground when you turn it on and send the whole uh, backlight voltage down the line it could be that or it could be something else in the in the biology of that cracked screen that caused a short to ground on the backlight line that then that huge burst of energy heated the coil and changed it in that way and that then when they took the screen off now the short is relieved because the short was internal to the screen and it just kind of leaves behind the aftermath and I did have to change the diode on that because the diode is always going to blow up in that situation <coughs> I've had rehab it's never the coil unless it's the cap getting coil and diode as well all right junk food all right um, Jessa is reading my messages. Ooh, ooh, I have a few boards like that first disaster. Shame boards. Well, they're not shame boards. They're your pets. You're going to fix them one day. Um, hiya. Corner damage connector bent pin or something. I think that, it, like in the iPad Air, you can you can easily damage. You don't think about this. The LCD side connector, if that thing gets banged up, the pins will slide, and it's you know in the air it's rampant. That you'll have one guy test this this bad LCD with just a little bangled connector. The pin slide, boom! There goes why that what the fuck? And the next one, boom! And he'll just ruin a set of four iPad Airs. Uh, with his bad LCD not screen it's from the board connector look new I don't think it's the connector well it's I don't think it's the connector either I think it's the screen 6s momentarily flashes up image then black I think I attached the iPhone 6 do you think it's the filter yes I do um, by the way, sometimes you use old coils to get wires for the 
fixing screw damage in solder jumpers, right? Not these kind of coils. We use vibrator motor coils that are very, very tiny. This is big fat wire, so none of these, no. Um, everything looks good in naked eye. The filter looks okay to me and connector as well. All right, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, inductance, yeah, it's, this is the same exact thing that we just read. Um, and believe me, until I get them working again, they are definitely shame boards. Finally, a live stream in European daytime. Thanks, Dan the man. Uh, Jessa, what's basically bad if an iPhone 5 has a touch that freaks out and just kind of works on one brightness level? Uh, I'm pretty sure in the iPhone 5 that there's no relationship between backlight and touch. Not off the top of my head. I, that would that I can't see. Um, but freaks touch freaking out, ghost touching is parts. And if you rule out parts, then it would be um, just like kind of after drop touch ICs. Those iPhone 5 touch ICs are underfilled, so it's a big pain in the ass, but definitely doable. In fact, I've got one here that I need to do. Thanks, Jessa. That makes sense as to why people keep saying it's never the coil on chats. Well, I mean, the everyone that's it's kind of a joke but it's like I I don't I recognize that there's a lot of new people to the channel and new people to board repair all the time and so I, I it bothered me that um, when when you kind of cross the line from haha -ha trolling in into the entire spirit of why I ever said it's never the coil or wrote that blog post back in 2014 I mean this is this is fast moving stuff. We, we see a new device every year, so it's kind of dated. Um, it bothered me that I saw someone do a whole bunch of work on a board and failed to play, replace an obviously damaged iPhone 6 coil because he said, well, I thought it was never the coil. And so it's like, I don't want anything that, that, I, that I say um, uh, with the spirit of getting people to think <laughs> which is why I ever said it again, to be used to make people not think. Ah, that, that totally kills me. Um, but, you know, ever since I've, you know, like I, I, I could have said, um, it, instead of saying it's never the coil, what, what it really means is um, outside of signature failures in backlight circuits, it's never the coil. But that's too long to write on a t-shirt. So we'll just shorten that down to it's never the coil. Especially because now the iPhone 6 uh, has a signature failure, just like the 3GS did. So in the iPhone 6, the coil will be part of that repair anytime you have a short on that anode line. All right, so let's see. Um, now, people, it's been explained. Can we stop the jokes? I, I doubt that. How was Auschwitz? It was, it was one of the most profound experiences that I ever had as an adult, that's for sure. I don't understand it as well. It's actually quite unusable till I set the right brightness level. Why don't you just change those touch IC chips? I bet it'll, it'll get better. What? Uh, I, don't, I don't get that. Are Apple unreliable in general, or are their products fine unless you drop it or, or get it wet? Um, that's a that's a tough question. I mean, I think there's a wide range of products, so I don't think you can generalize across all Apple products. So what I will say is that, in my experience, every mobile device that that has ever been issued has some sort of signature failure. So some of those uh, require a drop or something like that, but some of them don't. The iPhone 6 Plus touch disease is the number one fault of all time. Every, I believe that every iPhone 6 Plus ever made will ultimately get that, get that problem. It's clearly a board design defect. And, um, but you could make the argument on the other hand that well, you know, it works for like, a, they warranty it for a year and it, it might work for two years before it ends up coming down with this disease. Could they have predicted that 
I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that they could have predicted it at design time that that little trace was going to fail. Um, I think that, that they tested and they thought it was good, and so they put it out. Um, and it turned out to be a flaw. I don't think they addressed it well. I think they should have done more given that they put a device out there that has a flaw, but I don't think they did it on purpose. They certainly didn't do it on purpose. I, I doubt that they could have really predicted that. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of like a geriatric disease of the iPhone 6 Plus. So I don't think that, I don't really kind of blame them for that. Um, but more, more, the second most common problem would be charging disease. They are, they could be a lot more um, clear with marketing. They could do a big ad campaign to let people know that gas station chargers kill phones. And they don't, no one knows that. Uh, so they designed a product where the phone is, is expecting and dependent on the bona fide Apple charging cable that has voltage protection chips in it. And if you replace that with a gas station charging cable, the phone design now is totally exposed to uh, surger, surges of charger voltage and that kills phones all the time, which really kind of sucks. All right, is Mark gonna start streaming his Android repairs? I can't wait. Yes, he, in fact, I think he, he did one, he did some S6 charging thing that he was gonna put on my channel. He'll be here on Monday, so excited. I've been here for like two weeks all by myself. Um, 5S red screen repair screw damage, still red screen. So I think either connection is not good or, I don't think that there's any red screen and screw damage. That, that doesn't go together. Red screen's always proximity or ambient light sensor or something like that. Um, Regarding touch disease, we really haven't had any notable instances of it here in Australia. What? I've seen two in total out of many dozens. Not to say it's not here, though. It's totally there, man. I mean, my, my buddy Ben's fucking desk is... It's because every single touch disease in Australia is going to Ben's desk, which is piled, piled high with him. All right. Uh, let's see. 80% Android. Well, they don't really fail as much. No, you're you're you have sick, you have touch disease all around you. Either customers are just you know upgrading their phone, or they're still going back to Apple because you guys have that automatic two-year warranty, or or they're sending it to Ben or somebody else. But yeah, they're, they're, it's all around you. Do you know why gas station chargers break phones? Yes. Owners of gas station are Pakistani. Uh, racist? Most of phone repairs is Pakistani. N not true. More phones they broke, more business they have. Uh, no. Um, what's up, Nivaldo? Don't call the business line today because business phone I left at home. Whoops. Your conflicting data point has offended my frail ego. Sorry, um, why don't you go hang out with Ben for a day and help him out and fix, fix them all. I mean, we, we really haven't seen that many walk in here, probably like customers that walk in, um, I don't know, less than six, but we've fixed thousands of these phones because we're just well known for that niche that so we get all these mail-ins. But some shops that are, you know, we are, you know, we are 10 minutes from the Apple store. So people will go to Apple and now Apple will tell them, oh, we've got a $150 swap. That's a known problem, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, even, you know, local people walking in, we've seen, you know, half a dozen, a dozen maybe. Um, but, you know, it's kind of if you but in folks that come here for the course that have like big high traffic high volume stores they're seeing like six a day so it is it is definitely a huge thing i mean for us now like any six plus like this last one this one sitting right here you know this is here for backlight six plus i know it's going to need touch fix backlight no fucking touch of course all right um Fix my dad's car remote. Fantastic. All right. 
Ben has been trying to send stuff my way, but I'm still ramping up. Yeah, go talk to Ben. All right, and it is time. It's 5 fucking 30 in the morning. It is time for bed. So uh, you guys will absolutely see Jessa being trolled with it's never the coil stuff. Um, so, you know, spread, you know, kind of link to this video. And I, I do want people to to understand that the it's never the coil kind of meme it's funny it has a very very specific history that um was was kind of uh, a, a really passionate point of mine at the time but it's it's not something to be uh, applied universally you know it's just it really instead of it's never the coil you know i i should change that kind of I should probably retire that just because it has become confusing now since there are current phones with signature problems that are coil related um, to really be kind of like know your signature faults. Uh, if if a coil, coils don't fail unless they always fail. I mean, that's the thing. If they, if they are part of a signature problem, it's always going to be the coil. But outside of that, they never fail. So that's the, that's the message about coil failures. And I will see you guys next time.